Today, we begin coverage of the adaptive immune system. If the innate immune system is overwhelmed by the infection, the adaptive immune system will kick in. So let's go through some general points of adaptive immunity. The response to a pathogen is initially weak and it increases greatly over time. What happens is the system has to recognize a pathogen. And to do this, bits and pieces of the pathogen are presented to the adaptive immune system. And these are, of course, antigens. And this is a bilateral response. There is antibody immunity, which of course makes antibodies. And then there is cell mediated immunity that deals with cells that have gone off the rails because of infections, such as a viral infection. The players in the adaptive immunity are lymphocytes. And again, these are made from bone marrow stem cells. In this case, cytokines help to cause the differentiation into a lymphoid precursor cell. And then more cytokines either direct it towards a T cell or B cell. T cells mature in the thymus and B cells mature in the bone marrow. So there's two types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. Antigen presenting cells then present antigens to these cells. And these are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. I want to remind you that there's an interface between innate and the adaptive response. And this is a point to remember. Even after the adaptive response begins, the innate response is still active and is crucial in taking care of an infection. The adaptive response enhances the innate response. So where does the adaptive immune response occur? It occurs in the lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are all throughout your body and they're connected by the lymph vascular system. The spleen also captures antigens from your blood. The spleen, besides being a reservoir for red blood cells, also behaves like a giant lymph node and captures antigens from your blood and detects them. B cells can recognize or capture antigens directly, but their response is enhanced if the antigen is presented to them by an antigen presenting cell. T cells cannot capture antigens on their own. What happens is that a antigen presenting cell, such as a dendritic cell or a macrophage, will migrate through the afferent dunk to a lymph node. There it will encounter T cells or B cells, and if they in detect a matching antigen, there's an antigen that the B cell or T cell reacts to, they will then differentiate. Phagocytic cells play a critical role in adaptive immunity. Not only there are their reactions enhanced by the products of adaptive immunity, they are one type of antigen presenting cell. However, there are many other cells that can present antigens around the body, and we'll get into that in just a second. One of the more important ones is dendritic cells. Dendritic cells arise in the bone marrow. They migrate to tissues throughout the body for differentiation. They're present in most tissues of the body. They have long tendrils that are intermixed with other cells, and they will take up antigens or macromolecules in your body and then process them for presentation. They are present in all solid organs of the body except the brain, the eyes, and the testes. So dendritic cell functions. They're the first normally to detect pathogens and activate the immune system, and they're probably the most important antigen presenting cells in the body. Those located in the thymus help to educate T cells, and they will help to maintain the stimulation of B cells during infections until the infectious agent is cleared. Okay, now let's talk about lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a major type of white blood cell for adaptive immunity. They work with antigen presenting cells and they pretty much embody the features of adaptive immunity. And here are the features. First of all is specificity. The immune cells recognize and react with individual molecules, antigens, via direct molecular interactions. And the specificity is manifested in T cells and B cells. Immune cells are specific for non-self antigens. They don't react to self. 
And this is because of tolerance. And finally, memory. The immune response to a specific antigen is faster and stronger upon subsequent exposure because of the initial antigen exposure induces growth and division of antigen reactive cells that then are present for a second infection. Okay, the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about B cells. And the second lecture on adaptive immunity, we'll talk about T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are involved in antibody immunity. They make antibodies that react with antigens. On their surface, they will have 100,000 antibody molecules, either IgG or IgM, and they all have an identical binding site that recognizes a single antigen. The membrane-bound antibodies are receptors for the antigen, and each B cell is unique, and you have literally millions of different B cells, and each one has a unique antibody on it. Activation takes place when an antibody is recognized by this receptor on the B cell. And the book, Figure 16-2, has an animation that goes into this in details if you're interested. And again, that's open for everyone to look at. Binding of an antigen causes antibody receptors to cluster in a small area. This clumping activates a signaling cascade that activates expression of B cell genes and causes them to differentiate. B cells then go through a rapid division, which is called clonal expansion. The majority of these cells in this clonal expansion differentiate into plasma cells and start making antibodies. A smaller fraction of cells become memory cells. They don't differentiate to plasma cells. They remain as B cells that can be activated. These distribute throughout lymph nodes in the body, and those are ready for a further or future challenge by this pathogen. Okay, so a little bit about the maturation of B cells. The B of B cell comes from Bursa fabricus, which is an organ that's found in birds where B cells differentiate. In mammals, we don't have a Bursa fabricus, and B cells mature in the bone marrow and the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. They then travel in the bloodstream, T cells and B cells after they mature, and they settle into immune tissues throughout the body. Some of these will be on the digestive tract, as we talked about in module 10, and then some will be in the lymph nodes. B cells make antibodies. So let's talk about antibody structure. Antibodies are proteins, and you can see they have this Y structure. Here's a cartoon of this Y structure, and then here's what it actually looks like as a space filling model. Antibodies have a variable and constant region. The variable region, FAB, reacts with the antigen. The constant region, FAC, interacts with the immune system. Antibodies have two light chains and two heavy chains. Both have constant and variable regions. The heavy chain determines the type of antibody. There's five major types of antibodies that are formed in the body. First of all, there is IgM, IgG, secretary IgA, IgE, and IgD. The ones that are most important, where you get the most numbers, are IgM, IgG, and IgA. As you can see, they make up the vast majority, 96% or 99% of the antibodies that are formed. IgG can cross the placenta and a mother will give immunity to her child based upon what she's been exposed to. And these antibodies protect the child for the first few months of its life. IgM and IgG are the antibodies that can trigger the complement cascade. And I do want you to know the functions of the various antibodies that we talk about. And there, there's the functions, I won't go through it. Just, but I will say that IgM is the main antibody of the primary response. IgG is a blood antibody, and it's important in the secondary response. And then secretory IgA is in, involved in, is present in mucus, tears, saliva, and colostrum. How do antibodies affect pathogens? How do they kill? First of all, we've talked about some of these. There's complement activation. An antibody binding to an 
antigen on a pathogen will activate the complement cascade and that can be deadly in its own. There's also agglutination. The antibodies will bind to all the cells shown here. This is say this is a microbe that's the pathogen that's attacking. The antibodies will recognize it, they will clump and they will prevent the antigen or the pathogen from spreading. There's also toxin neutralization. If the, you know, in any infection, there will be hundreds of different antibodies that are formed against the pathogen. If a pathogen makes a protein toxin, a antibody is going to be made against it. And the binding of that antibody to the toxin will neutralize it. There is also obstinization. The binding of an antibody to a pathogen, the antibody serves as an opsonin and allows phagocytes to very quickly take up the, the uh, pathogen and eliminate it. And then finally, there's steric hindrance. Uh, these antibodies binding to different parts of a pathogen will prevent the function of whatever that pathogen part was going to be doing. So if it was necessary for binding to a cell, let's imagine you have a virus that's trying to infect, if an antibody binds to it, it's probably going to prevent that virus from then entering another cell. The course of the antibody response is the following. There's actually two, two different responses. A primary response that gets rid of an infection and then a secondary response if you're ever exposed to that pathogen again. Primary responses are slow and weak because you're first learning how to respond to a pathogen. It will take care of the infection. But again, remember all sorts of memory cells are created. The next time you see a pathogen, the response is much more rapid and you have much higher concentration of antibodies formed and an infection is cleared much faster. So primary responses are slow and weak. Secondary responses are rapid and strong. The affinity of antibody for the antigen increases with repeated exposure. There will be slight modifications to these variable regions and they get tuned to really bind to the antigen well. This is, and this secondary response is the basis behind vaccination. Remember, some B cells are differentiated into memory cells and they're primed and ready for a rapid response. And this is why you become immune to infections. Let's end these lectures with some clicker questions. Mm -hmm. Clonal expansion occurs when the antigen is encountered by a plasma cell secretes. This ends our section on antibody-mediated immunity.